Welcome back to the program. Now, uh, Paul Schaefer and is it everybody in the band tonight is going to be at the uh, big uh, deal or not? Yeah. Everybody yeah. in the in the rhythm section, yes. Well, tell them what it is. It's the uh, third annual Rock and Roll Hall of Fame dinner. Uh, we've been the uh, orchestra there for three years in a row, and uh, tonight they're inducting the Beatles and the Beach Boys, the Drifters, the Supremes, and uh, and somebody else, some other great rock, and and uh, the Drifters and somebody else. Yeah. And you make a fortune in tips, don't you? We uh, we do it out of the goodness of our heart because we love <laughs> rock and roll music, and somebody makes a hell of a lot of money. I'm not exactly sure who. Well, by the time this is on the air, it's already taken place, and plus yeah. you can't get in anyway, right? That's right. Can't possibly get in. Tables go for like $13 million a piece. Well, that's like with four chairs, isn't it? <laughs> four or five. Get a complete dinette set for can that, squeeze don't you? it. Well, that's true. So it is. It's or would that be six chairs? Whatever it is. Whatever it is, it is. Anyway, possible, uh, possible Beatles reunion tonight. We're kind of uh, all really? excited. Be very nice. Our first guest is one of the most influential comedians of our time. This man uh, was the first stand-up comedian to ever appear on the cover of Time magazine, and his offhand and irreverent approach to public officials helped change our political system. Folks, please say hello to Mort Saul. a little lull before we bring you up. Did I, uh, <laughs> did I change the political system? That's what it says right there, Mort. Made it all, what it all is today? Yeah. yeah, we have you to thank for that, I, I guess. <laughs> you read about the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration wants to, uh, they wanted the clearance last Thursday. They asked for this and was denied, by the way, to shoot down any plane in which there are drugs. Mm -hmm. I'd hate to see that MGM flight from L.A. going down over Jamaica Bay every afternoon, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Contemporary humor. Let's, uh, let's, uh, before we get to anything else you want to discuss, there's an aspect of your life that I've always been interested in and was never, of course, able to live it firsthand, uh, and that's the, when you were working clubs. Yeah. And we're, I guess we're talking about it, uh, an era that was in the 50s sometime and, and went right up 60s, to the mid-60s. 70s, and 80s. All right, but I mean the, the first great clubs, the ones that I always hear guys talking about, the ones that are now oh, no yeah, longer there. sure, the Hungry Eye. The Hungry Eye in San Francisco. The Crescendo in L.A. And was there Mr. Kelly's in Chicago? Chicago. Was that in there also? Yes, yes. Yeah. And what in New York did you work? Uh, the Blue Angel here with Jonathan Winters. Right. And, uh, uh, yeah, we were all around. Now, them. were these actual clubs, because there are, there are comedy clubs now yeah. that are, are not really club clubs, are they? No, these were like... Uh, Bon vivant kind of yeah. executives and black tie. And a big night out. Yeah, and you'd uh, you know you'd open for a singer, you mm -hmm. know, Peggy Lee or Julie London or yeah. somebody. And uh, actual supper clubs. Now, what, what was that exciting? Was it glamorous, or was it, it? Is this just something I have a false impression of? Well, it was uh, it was a drudgery, but uh, it uh, you learned how to do it. Yeah, and is that where you started being a stand-up comedian? I started in San Francisco, yeah. the Hungry Eye. Now, how does that work? If a, because now I think anybody who's interested in it understands, you go to California, you put your name on a list. Yeah. Sooner or later, you get a show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, but in those well, days, if, if you wanted to practice stand-up comedy, how did it begin? What was the first step? Who did you talk to? How did it work? Well, in San Francisco, you went to the Hungry Eye, which had folk singers. Right. A place with a brick wall, you know, and uh, no liquor, 25 cents to get in, beer and wine, and uh, American cheese and white bread, a lunch meat smorgasbord, <laughs> and you made your own sandwiches there. And they had folk singers, and I would uh, open for a folk singer, and if you were funny they might laugh if you weren't funny they thought it was whimsical they tried to get with it, it was pretty yuppie i guess uh -huh. maybe yeah you know and uh now are we, uh, forgive my <laughs> ignorance on this and many other topics but was are, are we talking about beatniks or was this after beatniks before beatniks first beatniks were better because they wrote you know they wrote something yeah they didn't just rent tapes <laughs> like this crowd but this was uh, kerouac etc then we go to yuppies uh -huh. you know those people who uh Somebody said the definition of a yuppie was somebody who thinks it's uh, courageous to eat in a restaurant that hasn't been reviewed yet, right? So, uh, okay. so anyway, yeah, back to the clubs. Yeah. And then you'd get up, and uh, nobody would laugh. In my case, it took about three months to get a laugh, yeah. you know, because I was talking in a strange language. Yeah. And uh, I was dealing in politics in 1953. And then we finally broke through with one joke. Which was? Which was, uh, at the time of Senator McCarthy, not your friend Gene, uh, but uh, Joe, Joe. And, and Dick Nixon. And the joke, it had to do with blacklisting. The joke was, every time uh, uh, 
the Russians put an American in jail, we put an American in jail to show them they can't get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were all right. And then, so it was this uh, kind of uh, subtle humor. And then I came to New York, and Jonathan and I were at the Blue Angel. Yeah. Who, else, who else was in that group? Lenny. Bruce was around. Now, uh, were you guys pretty much on the same level, or was one a little farther ahead uh, of the others? Well, uh, he can incite people more than I could, you know. Uh, we worked uh, together in San Francisco. He was at a club called the Purple Onion, and I was at the Hungry Eye, and they were across the street from each other. And he had a deal with the club owner to pay him every night. He never, he never uh, trusted club owners. Mm -hmm. And he had a Volvo station wagon, and if they didn't pay him every night when they closed out of the receipts in the uh, cash register, he would take all the furniture out of the club, you know, tables and chairs, and put it in the Volvo, uh, held hostage till he got his money. Yeah. <laughs> when he was busted for profanity, you know, they had police in front yeah. who would listen. You know, he never knew they were playing close police, even though they had uh, white socks and rather short haircuts and all, but he never caught on. And then he, one of his devices was to swear in Yiddish, but then they got bilingual police, you know, to sit in front. So he'd swear and they'd arrest him. Yeah. And I would go back and do his show and collect and go down and bail them out right. on, at the San Vicente and Santa Monica Boulevard at oh, the sure. sheriff's station, yeah, right? right. Remember so uh, I only did 12 minutes in those days, see, so I could do his show too. And the star would do about an hour, you know, Peggy Lee or whoever. And uh, a lot of people who see me now, you know, they'll say, uh, well, gee, now you do an hour and a half, what happened to your discipline? So yeah. I always say, well, <laughs> there wasn't that much wrong then, so I could cover it yeah. faster. Anyway, I would do uh, his show and then I, I would go back and my, do my show across the street and I would do his show, and i go back and do my show. And we did three shows that. Yeah. And it was a big convention of doctors in town from the American Medical Association. They're all reeling around the street without their wives, and they've got those buttons on. It says, hi, my name is Fred, you know, mm -hmm. Western Regional AMA. <laughs> so I'd finished. His second show was going back to do my second show, and as I crossed the street, these three dr doctors came lurching toward me, and a guy said, hey, kid, there's a guy in the other club doing all your material. <laughs> so I'm, honestly, I'm fairly well confused. So the <laughs> is uh, I, want, I want to talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, because I've never I don't know I can't talk to anybody else about it. And you're, really? you're the perfect the person. Here. So sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll do a commercial here. We'll be right back. With more stuff. Mark Saul is here. Uh, you know, you said something that went right by, and if you stop and if you stop and think about it, awesome. it's uh, inconceivable. What? The that they were waiting for him to swear on stage so they could arrest him. Oh yeah, that, I did say that, and went. Uh, yeah. I know, but I mean, if you stop and consider, what, if you go to in, into any comedy club anywhere in the country, it's likely you will hear somebody not swear. You know, I mean, it's just uh, the, the way things have turned upside down completely. But that for, in those days, you could be arrested for using swear words. Yeah, that's standard at, at comedian's equipment now. It's, it's, it's as standard as, uh, hi, how are you guys? I feel pretty good. I yeah. just came out here from New York. Right. Boy, is it hard to get a pizza in this town. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's the same kind of deal. But it's, uh, it's true. Uh, it would be hard. Now, they dissipated so much profanity that it, uh, it would be hard uh, to let people know you were angry by uh, cursing. Mm -hmm. It's like... Uh, sure. Our friend Mark Russell said, uh, you know, Madeline Murray, the famous atheist, her, her son became a Catholic. And I said to Mark, why? And he said he, he didn't know what to say when his mother sneezed. <laughs> so I went, oh, I'm just a joke, folks. We didn't mean any harm. <laughs> Is there, are there jokes that you used in the, the very early days that are now applicable in 1988 that you can change a little and, and use them as well? Oh, yeah. I suppose you could say... Uh, uh, you could say uh, Nixon's going on Mount Rushmore, both faces. <laughs> and there's somebody you'd probably like to apply that now yeah. uh, to now. Yeah. There's some jokes that won't die, and of course there's some things that uh, are extremely perishable. Um, well, let's talk, about, let's talk about the guys who are running for that office right now. Yeah. Speaking of perishable. <laughs> who, who, who gets your attention? Who do you like to work on? Who are you having fun with? Who, who do you have uh, sincere interest in? I was in uh, I was the White House Correspondents' Dinner this year with the president and uh, by the way you'll love this Jerry Falwell led the prayer mm -hmm. and he he turns to me and he said would you like to pray with us How about that <laughs> so uh, you know somebody had said that 30 years ago I might have had a different life yeah. so I realized that. <laughs> so I joined arms with Jerry Falwell Sam Donaldson who then joined arms with Ronald Reagan there were all of us you know me forgive me again but how does this happen <laughs> 
I mean, you were an outlaw. You were the guy <laughs> on the fringe, and now you're locking arms with Sam Donaldson, Jerry Falwell, and the president getting ready to, I don't know. That's yeah. right. And Doesn't that seem odd to you now? Well, they, uh, you know, they hired a comedian for the night to address the reporters. Mm -hmm. That's all that was. <laughs> oh, so just a gig for you. <laughs> 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 they're they're uh, uh, up close. It's interesting about Falwell, you know, uh, we put our heads down, you know, for the prayer, you know, that's how you do it, and if you've never done it, like I didn't. <laughs> and uh, as I did, you know, careful to tie a ground wire around my ankle in case, you know. <laughs> and uh, I looked up and Falwell said to me, we're not through yet. Oh. So he had a longer agenda than I did. You meet them as you go. I would say the bonus of this job, in my view, Dave, is, uh, is getting to meet them. You know, mm. I met the Reagan socially, but I met him when he was out of work. Mm. You know, I'm great with lost causes. <laughs> I mean... I, you're right. I mean, they're all friends of mine. Gene McCarthy's a friend of mine. Uh, General Haig is a friend of mine. Yeah. Now, is he, he is he is a candidate or well, not a, a candidate? Yeah, he's a candidate. Yeah. He, they're doing a fundraiser in uh, at Philadelphia on the 29th. Now, do you think that's a good idea? Uh, what's that, a fundraiser? Well, no. Or is no. being a candidate? Well, yeah, that he would be uh, running for this. Well, uh, yeah, he's... Uh, uh, he's going to make it kind of spicy. You know, it's a good idea to get some choice in there. And, and Gary Hart, quickly, anything here? No. I was going to say that... <laughs> I thought you did everything. Yeah. The, uh, I would say the, uh, the scandal was a cynical attempt to humanize Hart. That's what I always <laughs> felt. I never believed the word of it, but oh well. Uh, time has gotten away from us here. I, I, it, it's my fault because I wanted to talk about, and we didn't even really get a we'll chance to We'll have to, to meet at the it. Friars. Uh, all right. Take we'll a steam we'll and talk steam. about all That's this. That's right. Uh, anyway, come back anytime you're in this area. More good, you, to you. Good, good to see you. Thank you for being here. We have to uh, applause for social media. Here we go. Our next guest has been called the father of stand-up comedy, and tomorrow and Wednesday night, he will be appearing at Joe's Pub right here in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mort Saul. Mort! Greetings oh, from uh, George Miller. Well, tell him I said hello. It was 14 years. <laughs> My goodness, is that 14 right? 14 years, and I came here uh, from a dinner where Alexander Haig was running against George Bush the Elder. Wow. And I just saw Haig in Palm Beach, uh -huh. and uh, where he's retired with the AOL money. <laughs> 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 you got the network, but they got the money. And uh, <laughs> 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 thanks to Time Warner Cable. Hasn't this crisis brought you closer to your agent? Yeah. <laughs> We're all close. <laughs> so General Haig was selling prefabricated houses in Moscow and uh, his company. And uh, he said to me, Moscow has become almost like America. So he went to a sleek hotel, the Incon Intercontinental, and a lot of dot-com mi millionaires were driving up in Mercedes and Armani suits. They were boomers. They were like 54. They had Rolexes. And they had 18-year-old blondes on their arms. Oh, my. And he said, you, I could have been in Beverly Hills, except there were no communists. <laughs> Why don't you... Um... The, the show we do here in, in, in the Ed Sullivan Theater, you were on uh, the show a half a dozen times yeah. before. T tell us what that experience was like for you. Well, it was organized different logistically. Mm -hmm. I just want to say a word about the staff here. When I had to come to the stage, I had to go into the street and go through Times Square, come back into the theater. That happened with Regis' show. Is that right? Yeah, I was coming out of the Marriott Marquis, and the car didn't come. And I know you're close to Regis. That's why I bring this up. And then Regis called me. <laughs> There's nothing like knowing your host. Regis called me, and he said, I only had one car, and I sent it for Rich Little. <laughs> So I went to Regis' studio, and I stood in line with the audience. It was the only way to get in. <laughs> because of heightened security. I see, yeah. Before September 11th. And then I got in the audience, and then I tried to go on the show from the audience since I was booked. 
and the guards held me back. Oh my God! I thought I, I wanted his autograph. <laughs> well, they should know better than that. But yeah, I, I was think. in here with the. Uh, I was in here with the Beatles, Dave. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How many times were you on the show? Uh, Sullivan show. Yeah. About twenty-six. And and uh, how did you get along with Ed? Well, uh, he thought the stuff was pretentious because it, I thought it was politically meaningful. Mm -hmm. He thought it was pretentious, so he said to me. You've got to work more like that guy that people love, that little guy. Study that little guy. I said, well, who is he? He said, he's my favorite comedian. And I said, who is he? And he said, you know that little guy, the, the one with the red hair that's always explaining things to girls. I, he's my favorite comedian. I said, who is he? And, of course, it was Woody Allen, oh. whom he didn't remember. <laughs> and he said, you go home and think it over, and when you feel more like Woody Allen, I'll see if I can get you back in the show. And I went out in the hall... And J Fat Jack Leonard was walking in, and he said, I'm here to replace some guy that didn't get along with Ed. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you still see Woody Allen every now and then? Yeah, last night he came down to Joe's Pub to introduce mm -hmm. me, and I introduced him at the uh, Jazz Bakery mm -hmm. when he brought uh, the Dixieland band out, right. out there. And, 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 and he uh, said at one point that you had changed uh, his life, right? Yeah. He wrote in the New Yorker. You remember the New Yorker? Take the New Yorker days? Yes. <laughs> I don't take it anymore. Of course, now that I don't take it, everybody says, it's a great piece on it this week. <laughs> when I took it, there was never anything good in it. But uh, that's okay. So he said in there that... <laughs> he said in there that I changed his life. He said he was walking around San Francisco. He wasn't a film filmmaker then. He was a mm -hmm. comedian. And he said, uh, I just didn't think I was on the right track. I was full of doubt. And I walked into it a dirty section of San Francisco into a hole called the Hungry Eye. Mm. And there were 21 people watching a guy in a red sweater with a newspaper uh, talking polysyllabically about politics. <laughs> no one was laughing. It was a new form of comedy that I had developed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for recognizing my contribution, Dave. Yeah. So, he says, Mort doesn't know it, but he changed my life. So, when the Curse of the Jade Scorpion opened, the uh, a press agent from uh, uh, DreamWorks, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, author of The World Is Not Enough, <laughs> he, <laughs> he says, uh, they invited me. So I said, well, I can go see Woody and I'll tell him, you know, uh, thanks for saying I changed your life, even though I know it's not true. It's self-effacing. So I, I go into where the party is after the premiere and he's back there with his wife eating. And I go to try to talk to him to, and the bodyguard says, you can't talk to him. He's, uh -huh. He's got to have more time. You know, everybody stepped on him. He's given us so much. He's almost like a bullfighter. He's given us everything. And you can't talk to him. So I said, well, just go up to him and tell him the guy that changed his life is here. So the bodyguard goes over to Woody and he says, there's a guy in a doorway. And he says, he's the guy that changed your life. So Woody jumps up and quite uncharacteristically ran over and gave me this bone-crunching bear hug. And he backed away and he says... Can you change it back? <laughs> Pretty good. These are our old, our old friends. Pretty good. And you're going to be uh, at a Joe's Pub here yeah. in, in, in two nights, is that the game? Tuesday and Wednesday, the public theater. Uh -huh. And is it one show each night? Uh, if there's an overage, we'll do a second show. Oh, great, great. We, we work with traffic. Yeah. <laughs> is, is this great, Dave? You don't have to say, and you'll be at, at Giggles or the Funny Bone on the 21st. <laughs> the comedy club. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you again, Mort. Have Dave, fun while you're in town. Thanks for your Thank hospitality. You Mort Saul, we'll be right back, everybody. Thank you very much. This one improved, too, tonight. I know. Much better. Now things are starting to go yeah, our way. Yeah, let's just lock it in this way. All right. 
Uh, we're very happy to have our uh, next guest uh, with us. He is one of the most influential comedians of, of our time. Anybody you see working today has a little bit of this man in him. He will be appearing tomorrow night at Joe's Pub right here in New York City. How about a nice welcome for Mort Saul, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude. I, uh, George, this is a, uh, this is the New York Times, which states that George Bush has just given the world 24 hours to get out. <laughs> now, uh, I did a show four days ago for the National Conservative Union in, uh, uh Washington, and the president was there, and, uh, he said to me, um, uh, uh, just informally, you know, we're having coffee, dessert. And he said to me, the war on terrorism is pretty ugly. I said, I know, I'm pretty exhausted from fighting a war on communism before that. <laughs> and he said to me, uh, it's not a pleasant job, but this is the job that you elected me to do. And I said to him, we didn't elect you that much. <laughs> so... <laughs> Mamas, don't raise your babies to be president. It's Willie Nelson. So, uh, and, it, <laughs> and uh, Dick Cheney was at the dinner. Uh, you know, Daddy Warbucks, Condoleezza Rice, Little Orphan Annie, <laughs> Condoleezza Rice, ice sculpture, remember? <laughs> so, uh, they were at the dinner, and, and uh, 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 Cheney told me how he, is, uh, he courted Lynn Cheney at the University of Wyoming when they were... Uh, uh, both co-eds there, and he said that uh, their first date was on a Friday night. She arranged to meet him at an undisclosed, secure, underground location. <laughs> and Donald Rumsfeld was there, who told me the plans to surround Baghdad and insist that Saddam Hussein send Sean Penn out unharmed. <laughs> so, uh, and he made a speech to the conservative union, uh, at Rumsfeld, he said, we'll pay any price and we'll go anywhere to do what we have to do, which is a great speech. And this lady said, next to me, I said, it's a great speech. And then she said, yes, but it was better in the original German. <laughs> so we're just kind of... <laughs> the guest of honor at this dinner was Ariel Sharon, who, as you know, is facing Arafat over these elections, and Arafat is demanding uh, free elections and that the Israelis stopped building new settlements in the Hamptons. So, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so uh, 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 Sharon got up there, and Sharon told me a great joke. He said that uh, God had descended, uh, decided to, uh, uh, to end the world because he didn't like our behavior too much, but there wouldn't be any ark or anything. And uh, he just gave everybody 30 days warning in case they had kids in college or anything. <laughs> and... Uh, the Pope called all the Christians into Vatican City, and he said, uh, the world is going to end in a month, so make your plans. And the Grand Mullah of Islam called all of his disciples in to Mecca, and he said, the, uh, God informs me the world is going to end in uh, a month, so make your plans. And Ariel Sharon and Benjamin Netanyahu called the chief rabbi in Tel Aviv, and he called in the lesser rabbis, the, uh, and he said... Uh, we have 30 days to learn to breathe underwater. <laughs> Some of y'all think about it. Now, coming here, Dave, I was uh, stuck in a, for six hours in Raleigh, Durham because of the snowstorm last night watching the late show. That's what they run on American Airlines. <laughs> so I memorized all your shows up until now. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> And on the plane, there were all these women from Beverly Hills who were dissatisfied. And one of the women said to me, because we're on six hours and no food or liquor, she said to me, you, uh, you, uh, how many times have you been married? So I said, uh, three. And she said, you know what's wrong with all you men? I said, no, I've been waiting. You know, tell me. <laughs> she said, you only listen to your penis. <laughs> so recovering swiftly... I said, that's because it never lied to me. <laughs> hey.
that's closer to my heart rather than the politics. The last thing I want to say was uh, at the conservative uh, union dinner, uh, I was sitting next to Rupert Murdoch and Jack Welch. And uh, Welch said to me, I'm thinking of moving to California. I'd like to start a new life. Is it a good place to live? I said, yes, we've got a great new police chief there. He used to be in New York. And, uh, but we do have a gang problem. And he said, what does it consist of? And I said, there are 7,200 young men uh, uh, trafficking in high, high amounts of uh, cocaine and, uh, and uh, the, uh, two major groups, the Bloods and the Crips. So he said, General Electric would like to help. <laughs> and Mr. Murdoch, next to him, said, uh, the News Corporation will also help. So I walked away with my wife, and she said, you'll never hear from those guys again. Don't get seduced, because you're at a big-time dinner in black tie. So I said, I think I'll hear from them. I think these are good guys if you'll allow them to be citizens. So I wanted you to know I did hear from both of them. Let me tell you the action they took. General Electric bought the Bloods. <laughs> That's right. And uh, the News Corporation bought the Crips. <laughs> and they sent out two cost accountants from New York out to Los Angeles and started laying people off. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great job, Mort. Always a hey, pleasure. thanks for the hospitality, Good to see you. Dave. Have a great new year. My thanks also to the lovely Isabella Rossellini. Monday, Adam Sandler and the Pussycat Dolls have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. Good night, everybody. Oh.